live. Good afternoon and welcome. We're here in North Carolina and we are ready to do a live endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty or ESG procedure. We are going to show the whole procedure from start to finish. So thanks so much for joining us. And what I'm going to do is I'll basically talk through the whole procedure and explain the technique. Um, we're also going to answer questions, so please write in with any comments if you have them and we'll answer any questions that you have. So just to get started here, let's introduce our room here, the players in the room. we got Roche, he's our technician. So we're going to be working side by side here uh, during the procedure. We have Pam, our nurse, and uh, you know we're really proud of our team. And Dale over here in the corner is providing the anesthesia. Um, right back here, okay. Let's bring that camera back. Some guy in the back there too, okay. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So the ESG is an incisionless, non-surgical procedure. The basic, the basics of it are we're going to make the stomach smaller by suturing it from the inside instead of any external incisions. And the smaller stomach will lead to weight loss by allowing our patient to just eat less over time, feel full, and lose weight. So let's go ahead. We're going to start the procedure. We're going down into the stomach with a standard upper endoscope. And we're just going to get a look at everything and... Make sure her stomach's nice and healthy. And then we're actually going to mark the stomach to help guide us during the procedure. So we're on our way down the esophagus. And our patient's under general anesthesia, so she's asleep and comfortable. Our average procedure time is about 38 minutes. I would expect today will take just a bit longer. But this is overall a relatively brief procedure. So we're down in the stomach. We're looking at a normal, healthy stomach. And we're going to fill it up with gas to inflate it. And so we're going down the stomach towards the bottom. We're taking a look at her stomach. Pretty normal. She has about a 35 centimeter stomach in terms of length, and that's pretty average. All right, so first step here, we're going to mark the stomach so we know where to go during the procedure. Don't have to do this um, now that we've done very many of these, but um, this is going to help think with the process, explaining it to everybody. So we're using a device called argon plasma, or a technique called argon plasma coagulation. This little catheter that I just pushed out is going to shoot out argon gas, and then uh, it will spark and cause a, a little small burn that will mark her stomach. So what I'm going to do here, we're going to mark the back wall of the stomach. We're going to put a line coming up. We're going to mark the front wall of the stomach coming up. So I'll show that. I'm actually going to do separate little dots here, starting right about here. We're just going to work our way up, and this will help guide us during the procedure. Okay. So again, just a series of dots guiding us, and we're getting close to the top of the stomach. She's a nice, normal, healthy stomach, somewhat prominent folds in her stomach, which is within normal, but uh, we're going to see the configuration of the stomach change pretty significantly during this procedure. So we've marked the back wall of the stomach, and now we're going to mark the front wall. So we're reducing the diameter of the stomach by approximately 80%. So I'm just going to line this up and see where we're going. We're going to make a mark up here, and then complete our front line. This will make more sense when we finish. People ask, how much weight can you lose with the endoscopic sleeve? And on average, in our patients, at approximately a year after the procedure, they lose 23% of their total body weight. That's the data out of our first 100 patients. And what's that mean? If you start at about, a, let's say, 200 pounds starting weight, you can expect to lose approximately 50 pounds uh, on average, which is quite similar to the surgical sleeve gastrectomy. Um, maybe just a bit shy of that. So we've made the line uh, on the back wall, we have a, a line on the front wall, and what we're gonna do is suture those two together. As you can imagine, how much narrower the stomach will be at the end. I actually like to make a third line, we're gonna come up here to where the esophagus meets the stomach. We're gonna make a third line coming right across. And this is gonna mark the upper boundary of where we suture. I'm gonna try not to go above this and explain the reason why. But basically above this line, the top of the stomach, or the fundus, is located. You can go ahead and take that. So the top of the stomach has a very thin wall. It's about 50% thinner than the rest of the stomach down here. And so we're, we don't want to suture up here where we might hit adjacent structures 
the uh, spleen, the lungs, the diaphragm are up here, so we're going to stay clear of that. So there, we've marked the stomach. What we're going to do now is switch scopes, and we're going to use our suturing scope, the overstitch setup. We hand off the scope to Rocher, and then we're going to switch out. So, common question we get, you know, who's a candidate for ESG? I think really anybody who's not succeeding in losing weight through diet and exercise or other modalities is a candidate. There's no strict BMI cutoff. In general, we're looking at a BMI between 30 and 40, uh, but we've done this procedure anywhere from a low of 28 uh, up to mid-50s. It really is a matter of the patient, you know, is it appropriate for them? Our patient today, who is really nice uh, to, to participate in this process, is a great example of, of who you know, looks for this procedure, who's a good candidate. She gained weight after she retired several years ago, became less active, uh, and started gaining weight actually quit smoking a little while ago, a couple years ago, and gained weight after that, and then found it really difficult to lose weight. She started developing some joint pain, and really is trying to lose weight to get her joints back in the health, get active, uh, and get healthy overall. Um, all right, we're ready to switch out here. Thank you. Okay, so now we're switching scopes. We're using a, it's called a dual channel scope. It has two working channels that we can pass our instruments through. And on the tip is our suturing system, the overstitch device. It's going to allow us to suture from inside the stem. We have a few of them on. We'll get a chin with you. The scope's a bit large, so we're just going to assist it down into the stem. And almost there. All right. This is a really novel technique. The ability to suture from you know, entering through the mouth is really quite an innovation. And we love this tool, but it is uh, it was uh, a steep learning curve for us to, to learn how to use it. And it's technically pretty complex. But we're going to walk everyone through this today. And just a reminder, if you have any questions or comments, please type them in and, and we'll field any of those. All right. So here you can see in view, our, this is our needle. So you see I'm, I'm squeezing this handle and I'm able to pass that needle uh, and close that needle, and that's how we're going to suture. You can see the suture in the view there. All right. Next thing I'm going to load through the scope, something called the helix. This is basically a small corkscrew. Or should I go ahead and just push that out? Right. So you can see that. It's a little corkscrew pulled back in. That's going to allow us to grab the stomach tissue and pull it towards the scope so I can then pass the needle through it. So we're going down to the bottom of the stomach. We're going to start at the bottom and work our way to the top. And as I mentioned, we're going to suture this suture line, the, the, uh, this uh, APC line, which is at the front of the stomach, to the line at the back. Okay. And let me just see where we are here. Okay. Go ahead. So Roche is going to grab the stomach tissue. He's turning that device. And I'm going to pull it towards me. And we're actually going to do a better job of that. Hold on. Let's go right here. So he's corkscrewing in to grab the stomach tissue. Perfect. And I'm closing the handle, and so we have passed the needle through the stomach wall. Getting it a little twisted. We're going to untwist, and there we go. So what we're trying to achieve here is a full thickness bite. We actually want this, the needle to go through the entire stomach wall, and that means that suture will last really forever. It will not pull out. We're reloading. So we placed one. So one stitch there, you can see it entering and exiting through the stomach wall. And now we're going to work our way down. And once again, Roche will grab the stomach tissue. Go ahead. I have a last question. Yeah, what do you have? Um, Melissa wants to know, are there any side effects for ESP? So question from Melissa is, are there any side effects? The main side effects are in the first two days. Everybody has discomfort. It's described as a gas pressure, typically. Uh, it actually is from gas. Gas can get caught and trapped around the stomach, and it's left upper abdomen, and it lasts for roughly two days, then rapidly dissipates. Uh, some people will have some mild nausea and uh, a little bit of sore throat. And that's basically it. After the first couple of days, it's more a matter of fatigue. Let's go here. Because of the low calorie diet that our patients will follow initially. Okay. So we're all the way to the back wall, and we're pulling this in, closing our handle. So every time I close the handle and pass that needle through, I'm making sure I'm all the way through. There's a couple ways that we can tell. 
I get feedback from the device, I can actually feel almost like a, a crunch, really, that tells me I'm deep enough. And that, I, I know that suture is not going anywhere. Okay. If I weren't to do that, if we just thought, yeah, that looks pretty good and we're not quite deep enough, over time that suture will pull into the stomach and that suture could loosen. And that could lead to, uh, you know, a, a failure of this procedure. So it's really about the technique here. All right. Let's come across. Go ahead. So the recovery from this procedure is drastically shorter than any surgical sleep. Most of our patients are back to work in two to three days. They might feel a bit tired the first week, but the major you know, initial side effects are, have completely resolved. Uh, we generally have our patients back into light exercise within seven days after the procedure, and they can start more vigorous exercise generally within two weeks. All right. So what we've done here, just to explain, we've sutured from the front wall to the back wall. We came straight down. You can see that. We're going to make what we call a U-shape. So we're going to come down, we're going to come across the bottom, and then we're going to go back up. Then we're going to tighten that suture. And that's going to do a couple things. It's going to allow us to reduce the diameter of the stomach and at the same time bring the stomach in a shortening, for shortening. Okay. Let's go right here. Good. There's a lot of movement and contorting that goes into this just to make sure we're capturing the right thickness here. Roche's counting every time he turns this Helix device. He's whispering that in my ear. Um, and so then I know what he's doing. He's generally going to turn this about three to four turns, and, and that will drive to a certain depth here at the bottom of the stomach. As we get towards the top, he may only turn it twice. And I like to know what he's doing every time. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and, and we're always talking throughout this and um, making sure we're happy and that we're achieving perfection. Go ahead. Okay, so now we're coming back up, kind of completing the U, and I'm satisfied that every single time I've passed this needle through so far, it's, it's full thickness. I'm getting great feedback from the device, and it's really coming together nicely. This probably makes not a lot of sense to people who haven't seen this before. It will as we move along. After the probably first two or three sutures, you're going to start to see a dramatic change in the stomach shape. But haven't done much yet. All right, let's go right here. Question, yeah. How does ESG differ from a vertical sleeve? Yeah, so question, how does the ESG differ from a surgical sleeve gastrectomy? So there's a lot of similarities, but there's also some key differences. The main similarity is the way that it works. So we're reducing the size of the stomach, so it's a restrictive procedure. There's no malabsorption component like a gastric bypass. We're making somewhat a sleeve shape, so kind of a tubular, uh, narrow shape. Let's go here. So those are the main similarities. Of course, the big difference is good. We're, we're working through the mouth, not through the abdominal wall. Um, the recovery is a huge difference, so it's much faster. I already commented on the expected weight loss, which will vary. If you look at studies and you know it published data anywhere from 15 to 20 percent body loss again I mentioned ours is, is maybe a bit higher and, but you're gonna see variation between centers the shape though the final result is different with this compared to the surgical sleeve with the surgical sleeve a surgeon is stapling off the stomach and then cutting away the stomach it's really a long banana shape at the end all right let's finish it right here in this case we're shortening and narrowing the stomach so it kind of bunches up tight so the stomach's actually 50 percent shorter when we finish with this procedure. So that's a key difference. We also don't touch the top of the stomach, as I mentioned. All right. And so the end result is a stomach that has a little cap on top, and then it's very narrow below that. So we're, gonna, we're done with this U-shape. We're ready to tighten the suture. So I've dropped the little uh, anchor here. Roche is going to pull that up. Now, I can't hand tie this suture. So what we're going to use is a device called a cinch. That's going to allow me to tighten the suture and then cut it, and it'll stay permanent. All right, he's going to load that up. I have another question. Have you Question, yep. Um, Keith and Joel Campbell would like to know, do we do these procedures in a clinic or do we do them in a hospital? So question from Keith, you said? Yes. Do we do these procedures in a hospital or a clinic? So we're currently in a hospital. This is an outpatient same-day procedure, but we are in a hospital. This can be done in an ambulatory center. Um, 
but we're currently in a hospital. That's where our team is located. But it's same day, so she's going to have this procedure. She'll wake up, recover for about an hour to two, and then go home. She traveled in from a little bit outside of town, so she'll stay around uh, for a day or two, and then she can go home. So what's going on here is I'm drawing in the suture and tightening it. You can see it all gathering together. I want this to be tight, but not too tight. And then Roche, right now, is going to cinch it. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Good. That suture is locked in place. And there we go. That's our first suture. There's always a little bit of blood during this procedure. That's normal. That's a sign of a good, healthy stomach. It has a nice, rich blood supply. If anyone has a sensitive stomach, um, you know, we, we do see blood during this procedure, so just be aware of that. What I'm doing is just cleaning out the stomach now, just rinsing out some of the water that's in here. All right, so we've placed our first suture, and the stomach exit is up through here. You can see how tight this is going to be. What we're going to do now is make another line of sutures, starting here and running, kind of hugging what we just did. All right. So I'm going to load up the next suture. So this is suture number two. So you can see how much we did with suture number one. We took probably, uh, in that case, uh, go. about eight bites through the stomach wall as we made our way around. It's going to really anchor that suture in there. Okay. Now I'm loading the next suture onto our curved needle body, reloading our helix, and we're going to get to work and do the next one. So the way we'll do this is a series of U's working our way all the way to the top. So I'm going to go right up to where we were. We finished up in this area, and so we're going to kind of hug that area with the next one. So let's go right back. Same thing, Roche's driving that in. Okay. And closing, and moving on. When we first started doing these procedures, uh, about a year and a half ago, it took us um, about two hours and 45 minutes, our first procedure. Um, probably, you know, two plus hours, our first 10 or more, and now we're down to, like I say, about 30 to 40 minutes in general. Right here. I'll give a, little, a shout out to Dr. Kamari of uh, John Hopkins, who was here last May, helping us, uh, you know, start our program and, and train our team here. We really appreciate the help he gave us. All right, moving down. Yeah. All right, so question, what is the diet before ESG? What is required? How many days before? We don't have a, a major requirement. Uh, we, we ask our patients to be on a liquid diet the day before. We just want to make sure their stomach's completely empty for the procedure. Um, but there isn't like a liver reduction diet, you know, for two weeks leading up to this, like you would have with a surgical procedure. Um, so really pretty minimal. Thank you for the question. Go up here. Okay. Dr. Mallory, I have a question from the patient um, what is the recovery time for ESG? All right, another question. What is the recovery time for ESG? I think I touched on that a little bit. Two to three days for the majority of it. Um, after that, it's, it's feeling pretty good. What we generally stress for our patients is expect discomfort. It's generally mild to moderate at worst, quite manageable. We do provide pain medication. Let's go here. Uh, to help, I'd say 50-50 whether people need it. Some people are fine just with Tylenol. Um, we do provide nausea medication as well, which will be taken around the clock for the first day. And then the, the, the tough part, one of the toughest aspects of this in the beginning is this stomach is ultra tight when we're finished. It's a little bit swollen inside and you cannot just drink down fluid easily. So we advise our patients to sip really throughout the day, every 10 minutes, try to get an ounce or so in, an ounce or two, because uh, it's hard to do more than that the first day. Okay. And then that gets easier and easier as things heal. Question okay. from Laura. Can it be normal to have lingering pain past seven days after ESG? Question from Laura, is it normal to have, or can it be normal to have lingering pain beyond seven days? It can happen. It's not common, but we definitely see that from time to time. Uh, cramping would be the big complaint, uh, especially as our patients transition their diet along from clear liquids the first three days into full liquids, which they typically follow for two weeks. Um, 
there can be some lingering discomfort. It's not unusual. Uh, for some patients, it just takes longer to recover from it. It's right about there. Yep. So everyone's a little bit different. It's a little hard to predict, you know, exactly how every patient will, be, will do. But in general, it's that two to three days, and then I'd say some lingering cramping here and there as, as things move along and heal. There's a lot of healing that goes on the first couple of weeks, and this will be pretty much healed uh, within... Uh, Probably three, maximum six weeks. All right. Common question from patients. Will I have to take vitamins after ESG? So question, will I have to take vitamins after ESG? We recommend them initially, um, but not long term. Maybe for the first month or two while your calories are kind of low overall. Right about here. Yep. Question from Jeff. Okay. Question I from Jeff. I know a guy in North Carolina you guys accept patients that are outside of Jess asked uh, if she lives elsewhere, can she travel for this procedure? Uh, yes, it's certainly possible. A lot of our patients, many of our patients, come from out of state or further. Um, we typically just have them stay in town um, for a couple of days, and then they can, they can certainly travel back home, and that's totally fine. We're getting ready to finish with this suture as well. Question from Ms. Is there a preferred protein shake once the patient moves on to a pool with the Question from Misty. Is there a preferred protein shake? Not really. Um, we often recommend Premier Protein. It's just convenient. It comes in the... We have a little bit of bleeding here, which is common. Nothing to worry about. Um, but yeah, um, Premier Protein is convenient. You can get it anywhere. It's in these small 11-ounce containers. It's 30 grams, which is really nice. Um, but really, any type of... We typically recommend a whey protein. A whey isolate is really the highest quality, so that's something we might want to look for. Um, but any variety of uh, different brands. Okay. So we're getting ready to cinch this suture. Question from Julie. Why does alcohol affect the stomach in minimal amounts? Question from Julie. Why does alcohol affect the stomach in minimal amounts? That's really only true in the beginning. The first week or so, you're probably only consuming your upper 500 calories a day at most. You're only on liquids and you just really can't tolerate alcohol in that beginning period. Um, once we get later, further along, it's certainly reasonable to have alcohol in moderation. We typically want you to wait maybe six months or more. So we're gonna cinch this one. Same thing, I'm pulling that suture in. You can see it coming together. I'll wash my lens. Not washing it, is there water okay over there? Right. And this is coming in nicely. So let's cinch right there. Good. So we have two down. We're working our way up the stomach. We're going to clean up a little bit and we'll take a look at what we've done. Question for Pete. Is ESG an option for a person that has severe fatty liver? Question for Keith is ESG an option for someone who has severe fatty liver? I guess it depends what you mean by severe. Um, it's absolutely an option for someone with fatty liver. In fact, it's a great option for someone with fatty liver disease. I mean, the only proven treatment for fatty liver is weight loss. And typically, you can reverse your fatty liver if you lose 7% of your total body weight. And as I mentioned, we're losing 15 to 20%. So in, in that way, it would, be a, it would be a great option. Question from Vicky. How long after ESG can I drive? Question from Vicky, how long after ESG can I drive? Uh, if you feel up to it the day after, it would be fine. We don't want you driving the day of. We would certainly have people drive the day after, so that would be fine. Okay, uh, so we've done two sutures. We're working our way up, and the stomach is coming together. I think after the next one, it's going to look uh, much more obvious what we've done. Question from Christian. Okay. Is the brain affected with non-surgical sleep? Question from uh, Christian, is, uh -huh. is ghrelin affected? Yes. Right, great question. So ghrelin is the key hunger hormone in the body. It's one of the most powerful hormones. If you've ever tried to fast, at first it seems doable, and then you will have a ravenous appetite that you can't overcome. That's due to ghrelin. It's produced by the stomach. It's actually produced in the stomach lining, primarily at the top of the stomach in the fundus. This kind of question that we get. After a surgical sleeve, the stomach tissue is cut away, and so ghrelin goes down uh, because there's less stomach. And that will typically stay low for up to a year, then it will rebound. With this procedure, we're indirectly affecting ghrelin, at least we think. So um, 
basically, uh, let's go. So we're going to start our third suture here. And let's go right up there. So because we're leaving the fundus intact, after you eat a meal, your stomach's going to fill up primarily up in the fundus. So you eat a meal, it stretches the fundus. And stretch of the fundus is what leads to ghrelin levels going down. So what we see is a small portion, you feel full, your ghrelin level plummets, um, and then and it stays lower. So it's probably one of the bigger pleasant surprises when we started doing these procedures is our patients really generally aren't terribly hungry for months afterwards. And I think it's due to that. There were early, uh, go ahead here, initial studies at a Mayo Clinic where they looked at ghrelin levels and did show a decrease following this procedure. But that was on a limited basis, but uh, we do think it affects it just in a different way. Okay, so same process. This is kind of repetitive. We're just working our way, making this U-shape from the bottom of the stomach to the top. Um, yep, question? Mm -hmm. How many calories the question from Tracy is how many calories should you eat eventually to maintain steady weight loss? A lot of that's going to depend on the patient, uh, their starting weight, their really the resting energy expenditure. Uh, I would say for most of our female patients, we're going to recommend somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 calories. I think that's a, that's a good goal. It will depend on activity level. Uh, for someone who's extremely active, they may need more. For a man, it might be higher. It might be closer to 1,500 calories. Uh, let's get right here. Weight loss is really complex. It's not just calories in and calories out. I think that can be frustrating sometimes uh, because you want to lose weight fast, but it's just not so simple. The body tries very hard to maintain its current weight. And so just cutting calories will lead to weight loss, but it does take time. And that's why we say this is typically a 6 to 12 month or even 18 month process. I think we're going to, that's a good call. We're actually, okay, yeah, let's do that. Ken has a question about Yeah, go ahead. Who is it? Ken. Ken, yeah. She wants to know, is this a long-term weight loss procedure or a short-term? All right, question from Kim. Is this a long-term or short-term procedure? This is a long-term procedure. So we're going to cinch here. Uh, the longest data uh, we have now are five years. Uh, from Cornell and Dr. Shariah, um, which showed uh, maintenance of weight loss for five years. That's really as long as anything it can be. Um, and so we do look at this as long term. How do we ensure that it's long term? A lot of it boils down to the technique and making sure all these sutures are placed appropriately and full thickness, and then it, it should last. It will last. So I would view it as long term uh, as anything. Of course, we can see weight regain after any type of weight loss procedure. It's uh, one of the common things that we treat now using this device is weight regain after gastric bypass or surgical sleeves where we revise those uh, to make them tight again. But again, as much as anything else, this is long term. All right, we're going to cinch this. Question from Steve. Can it be done at the BMI is 41? Question from Keith. Keith. Can this be done for a BMI of 41? Of course, yes. Uh, let's cinch right here. Yeah, as I mentioned, there's no strict BMI criteria. Uh, our average, like I said, is 38. That means we certainly go above that at times. And uh, 41, assuming you're a candidate otherwise, certainly. All right, we're just cleaning up. So that time what we did, we didn't actually make a U shape for those of you paying close attention there. We just made a straight line down and cinched it. That just allows us to get an extra suture in there without shortening the stomach. Because eventually we're going to shorten the stomach so much that we're at the top. And then we can't get any more sutures in there. We want to add a few extra sutures just to give us some extra stability over time. I guess that's a good point to bring up one of the most common questions we get. Are my sutures going to break? Or I feel less restriction. Did something break? No, they're really not likely to break. Highly unlikely. It takes a lot of force to break these. If something were to happen with a suture, with a suture it would be that it was not placed correctly. It wasn't th uh, full thickness and kind of pulled its way through the stomach. Uh, but that's why every time I pass this needle through, I'm making sure it's full thickness. And then I don't have any concern that that's going to happen. All right, so we're loading our four, correct? Yeah. Our average number of sutures is six. Depends on the stomach, size of the stomach. Typically, yeah, somewhere between five and seven. Question from, Question from Candace. Yep, go ahead. Am I able to have these, I, I don't have to use these, my DMI is just at 
Am I able to have ESG if my BMI is 26? Mm -hmm. You know, that's certainly on the lower end. Um, and I think if we're down in that territory, I would want to explore, you know, what, what's going on? Why are we looking for this type of procedure? If the BMI is 26, it can certainly be done. Um, go ahead here. But, I, you know, I certainly want to be uh, sure that all other options have kind of been explored and that things have been tried, but there's no contraindication based on BMI. Question from Julie. When can you add exercises after ESG? Question from Julie is when can you add exercise in after ESG? So uh, we want our patients really walking and moving right afterwards. By day seven, we want to do light activity, um, starting with light walking on a daily basis. And by day 14, typically, you can start more vigorous activity. It's not dangerous to start sooner. It's just a matter of energy level. Go ahead here. We don't want our patients to wear themselves down by diving right into really vigorous activity before they're meeting their protein goals. Typically, we want a minimum of 60 grams of protein per day after this, but that depends on the patient. For a larger man, we might want 80 or even 100 grams of protein a day. And if you're not achieving that, it's probably not worth exercising really vigorously because you're just going to wear out. Um, okay. okay. Um, do you want to know in specific add right. exercises? Oh, uh, specifically ab exercises? Uh, yeah, you won't hurt anything by doing ab exercises. I think that's certainly fine. Everything we're doing is internal within the stomach, so abdominal wall doesn't really play into this. We probably focus more on cardiovascular activity first, though, but that's certainly fine. Question from Christian. Are you able to sure. have ESG after having an orbital balloon? Mm -hmm. Question from Christian. Are you able to have ESG after an orbital balloon? So uh, presumably a balloon that didn't work out perfectly. Um, yes, you can. The stomach is unchanged after Rivera, and so it's certainly fine to move on to this. We've done that for uh, several patients. We usually advise waiting a bit after the balloon is removed. The stomach's uh, much stronger after you have an Rivera balloon. It's been working for six months, um, kind of squeezing against that balloon, and, and the, the stomach wall is basically thicker. And so we'll generally say wait, you know, six months or a year even before moving on to ESG, um, just so the stomach returns to its normal, kind of normal state. Right. How are we feeling about this? It's coming together. <laughs> All right, let's go here. Question from Tracy. I've heard mixed information about carbonated drinks after this procedure. Are these a yes or a no? Question from Tracy. Are carbonated drinks okay? Uh, initially, no. I would not advise it. It would be pretty uncomfortable drinking carbonated drinks uh, after this, at least in the beginning. It causes too much distension of the stomach, and you just probably won't feel great. Uh, later on, you know, I, I think it's certainly reasonable to try if you like. It won't cause any harm. We definitely have patients who even a, a year out say, you know, drinking a, a sip of beer makes them feel uncomfortable. But it really varies from person to person. So we've uh, worked our way down the stomach. We're going to come back up again in the U shape, just as we've been doing. Let's go right here. from Ashley, will I develop saggy skin? Uh, also a very common question. You don't see it very often. The, the weight loss after ESG is gradual. You know, it's over a year or more, uh, potentially. Losing a pound to two a week at most, typically. And so, uh, you know, as long as you're exercising, and we, we're going to recommend uh, strength training or resistance exercising at least twice a week minimum, we're able to usually maintain tone. But certainly, if, if you're losing a lot of weight, there's that potential. But we, we don't seem to see it very often. Okay. Question from Becky. Will ESG interfere with me becoming, becoming pregnant? Question from Becky. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Um, it will not. Uh, no, we would certainly want you to recover from this fully um, before you start thinking about pregnancy. In reality, you're likely to become more fertile potentially after this by losing weight. Obesity definitely interferes with fertility in some instances. So uh, otherwise, no, it does not interfere. Let's go here. Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica. Will ESG interfere with me becoming pregnant? Question from Jessica.
Oh, can I comment more on carbonated drinks and if it will affect the stomach? Stretch. 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 Uh, right. Uh, no, it would be really hard to stretch the stomach just by drinking a carbonated drink, other than causing indigestion. If you like to go here, it, you're not going to break a suture or anything like that. Um, so, uh, no, I, I don't think there needs to be a concern there. Yes, question. Question from Shoshana. How many sutures do we typically use? Uh, I think I mentioned the average of six or so, depending on the patient, uh, depending on how things are coming together. It really depends. Um, we've gone as high as nine. Uh, for a really small stomach, we can, we can complete this procedure in four sutures, but we generally like to have around six uh, on average. Is the video a little dark, do you feel like? Yeah. Is it looking okay, guys, over there? Maybe yeah. turn up the yeah. brightness on here? Yeah. yeah. Can we turn it up? Yeah, maybe turn up the brightness a couple notches. It just seems a little okay. dark. I really appreciate uh, all the questions from everybody. It, it might be because the room lights are on. It just looks There's dark. Just one more, one more oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So we're cinching this one. Over time, we just get used to how much tension to put on these sutures. Of course, if we over pull, we could break it. And that's looking good. Let's cinch right here. Want me to load number five? Yeah, load it up. Thank you. I'm in question about the diamond. What if the HP doesn't work for me? Am I allowed to have a regular box procedure? Next question, what if ESG doesn't work for me, am I allowed to have another weight loss procedure? Which is also you know, a great question. A weight loss procedure, whether it's ESG, a surgical procedure, you know, that doesn't always work for everybody. So yes, you can, this, uh, while technically permanent, um, you can go on to something else if needed, uh, such as a gastric bypass or potentially a surgical sleeve uh, or duodenal switch. So yes, that's still an option if needed. It's been described uh, elsewhere. So we're just cleaning up here. I think we're going to do one more suture, okay. and then we should be done. Okay. Question from Jeff. With ESG, will I have the dumping syndrome? With ES oh, question from Jeff was, with ESG, will I have the dumping syndrome? No, you will not. Dumping syndrome occurs after a gastric bypass. Um, and is really not relevant to this procedure, so no, that won't happen. Question from Shoshana. What is the recommended procedure for a person with BMI of 31 and on three diabetic medications? Question from Shoshana. BMI of 31 on diabetes medications? Yes. Uh, absolutely. Yep. So, um, you know, weight loss would lead to reversal of diabetes, assuming uh, we lose sufficient weight. So that's not at all a contraindication. You know, when we're not going to recommend ESG is someone who has multiple medical comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. You know, just, just we need a, something that's going to be more effective right out of the gates in terms of improvement in metabolics. Um, and so then something like a gastric bypass is going to be uh, preferable. So just bear with me as we clean up here. We left a little stuff up there. So. Nearly complete, though. I hope you get a sense of how narrow the stomach is getting at this point. And that's our suture line coming straight up. And I'm going to put a little gas in here so we can see what's left. We've come up. It's hard to see, but we, we've reached our line that we marked, kind of the uh, don't go above line. It's right up here. Let's get some air in here. It's, it's inflated here. Okay. I just want to ensure that everything's clean. If we leave any blood in here, and these are, we're magnified, you know, these are tiny bits of blood, but blood in the stomach causes nausea, and we definitely don't want that afterwards. What we've found is we have very little nausea after this procedure, uh, primarily because our uh, amazing anesthesia providers, we've optimized our setup here. We do not use any inhaled anesthesia. We only use one medicine, propofol. The same medicine you'd get if you had a colonoscopy uh, or upper endoscopy, and it just doesn't cause nausea. So. Uh, also, by reducing the length of our procedures to well under an hour, you see less nausea in recovery. Okay, so we clean that out. Get a little air in here and take a look at what we have left to do. 
we ask all of our patients to take uh, medicine before the procedure to help prevent nausea and help prevent pain. It's a simple little cocktail of a medicine called Men, which is very strong and potent at preventing nausea, two extra strength Tylenol, and a medicine called Gabapentin, which works through nerve pathways to reduce pain. And, and it's really drastically reduced our pain in the recovery area. Our air is not quite as good at the moment. You notice this? Yeah. Something in the channel. Yeah. All right, so we're almost done. You know, a lot of things come up during these procedures that are uh, really technically involved. The device is amazing, but it's um, unforgiving. So, you know, we've, we've seen everything over the past, uh, we've done 130 some overseas procedures. Um, this one's actually going pretty smoothly. Shouldn't have said that. Um, let's go, okay. You know that Okay. All right, so we're nearly complete here. I think it's gonna be another, yeah, less than 10 minutes probably. So we're gonna start turning down our sedation so our patient will wake up nice and fast afterwards. Any other questions over there, Tisha? Um, okay. Um, I think we're gonna finish with the U-shape. We've got our line right here. So. I think this suture may be one more. Okay, right here. Good. So again, as we're getting towards the top of the stomach, the stomach wall gets thinner and thinner. And we're only gonna turn this helix, you know, maybe two times. We don't wanna to drive too deep. Roche is always counting in my ear, telling me how many times he turns it. I'm looking at the tissue as we pull it in and making sure we're, we're getting a good grasp uh, of the stomach. We want to actually grab the muscle layer, so we're actually grabbing the all the way through the stomach wall. Go ahead. You know, like, yeah. Tina would like to know how many ESG procedures have you done collectively? Tina wants to know how many ESG procedures, Gina, how many ESG procedures we've done. Um, I just said about uh, 130 total procedures um, at this point. Thomas is, am I able to have this type of procedure if I've had a gastric sleeve before? Thomas asks, can I have this procedure if I've had a gastric sleeve? So, kind of. Yeah, one of the procedures we perform pretty commonly is a sleeve revision. So revising a surgical sleeve. It's a somewhat similar process. We are basically suturing the stomach to make it small again. You know, a surgical sleeve can stretch out over time. And so we can uh, do this similar technique just to make it small. Uh, go ahead. So in a sense, yes. We would call it a revision um, as opposed to a primary sleeve. But um, yes. Same thing if you've had gastric bypass and have gained weight and your pouch has enlarged uh, and you feel less fullness, we can go in and, and tighten that out through tighten that up through a, a different type of technique. Okay. Question for Monica, am I able to eat meat after having the ESG procedure? Question from Monica, am I able to eat meat after the ESG procedure? Absolutely. Um, not right away though. Uh, by week five to six, we're going to transition to regular foods, including meats. And really, we want you to eat, if you're a, a meat eater, we want you to have lean proteins, uh, chicken, fish, things like that. Of course, you can eat beef. Um, but yes, you can. In fact, what we emphasize after this procedure is always eating protein first, so lean proteins at every meal to start. Let's go right here. Then vegetables, and then save your carbohydrates for last. The, the least nutritious component of your meal, and so hopefully you'll be full from your proteins and vegetables, and maybe not even need that. But uh, certainly you can eat carbohydrates. But yeah, protein first. The other change long term, so we're just looking at this, That's not a, that is not a full thickness bite. That's going to pull out, and so what I'm going to do is probably just pull that out. There we go. So you saw that. So that was not, I did not go deep enough, and you can see how that pulled out pretty easily. Um, so we always have to make sure we're full thickness. So I'm just going to redo that one, and no big deal. Question from Julie. What is the percentage of restriction failure after a month? Julie asked, what is the percentage of restriction failure after a month? Uh, let's go here. I think... Uh, 
It depends how you're defining restriction failure. There should not be a failure of restriction at a mind. I think the sense of restriction or the feeling of restriction can change. You know, the stomach's swollen and uh, really tight right after this, and that swelling's gonna go down over the first couple of weeks, and so the feeling of restriction may be different. Um, but the sleeve is still intact at that point, fully intact. So it's more a sense of what does it feel like, and it's really different for every person. Some people, it's a, a very clear fullness. Um, you know, they eat one bite too much or drink one sip too much, and they get immediate feedback and feel extremely full. For other people, it's a little more subtle. It's a little more of an indigestion type feeling, and that just varies from person to person. Go here. Question from Vicky. What would happen if I got sick after ESG such as a stomach blow? Vicky asked, what would happen if I got sick after ESG, such as having a stomach bug? I guess the concern being vomiting? Um, nothing. You know, you can certainly vomit after this procedure uh, and, and aren't aren't likely to damage every, any, anything at all. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Question from Jeff. Yeah. Um, I have a question. How much would a person have to eat to stretch their stomach back out, or would it be a frequency of eating too much? Let's go right here. Julie asks, how much would a, a person have to eat to stretch their stomach out, or would it be more of a frequency of eating too much? Uh, yeah, I think it would be really hard. You're not going to stretch your stomach out in one meal. Um, I wouldn't try to or attempt it. Uh, you know, we definitely want you to listen, eat slowly, and listen to your body. Let's cinch here. Um, but yes, conceivably, if you overeat over time consistently, um, the stomach, not where we suture you, but the rest of the stomach could stretch out uh, over time, potentially. But it wouldn't be easy to do. All right, we're going to cinch this last one, and then I believe we are probably done, but we'll check it out. Which is really vague for you, Dale, but um, what are we thinking, Roche? I think we're looking pretty good here. Yeah. Turn it, Turn it off and I'll let you know if we're going to do a quick last suture. This is six, right? Five. 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 Yeah, so sometimes we finish in five. And that is totally fine. Alright, so we're pulling this in and we're going to cinch right here. So I'm going to clean up a little bit, have a look, see if we need to do one last suture. But I think we're probably done. It's looking really tight. Yeah, I think it's turning out pretty good. So when we're finished, we're going to wake our patient up, and she's going to go out to recovery, and she'll be up within a couple minutes, probably. Um, and then we give very little pain medicine during this. Have you given the Tordol? Yeah, uh, that fentanyl. We give a tiny bit of uh, fentanyl, which is a short-acting pain medicine, and Tordol, which is an anti-inflammatory. Um, and then we, we let our patients wake up and we see how they're feeling. If they need more pain medicine, we'll give it. Um, but we don't like to overdo it because that just means longer recovery process and trying to wake up out there. Most of our patients would prefer to go home and rest and recover, not hang out here too long. We give three liters of total IV fluid during this procedure, or during their entire time here, and that way there will be no risk of dehydration or minimal risk over the next couple days. I think we're, I think we're good. That's about 50 minutes total. Yeah, we're done. Let me get some final shots here. So I've gone all the way through to the beginning of the stomach. And so, yeah, we've reduced her stomach from 35 centimeters to 20, some, 20 centimeters. Reduced the length by half. And you get a sense that this stomach is very, almost tight against our scope. But it's very narrow now. Just going to do some final cleanup, but we're finished. And so she's, our patient's going to be able to eat much less over time and yet feel full and satisfied and lose weight.
Usually in the first month, we see the biggest drop in weight. Uh, depends on the patient, depends on the starting weight, but anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds is pretty common. Then we typically see a plateau for a week or two as the body's kind of adjusting to everything. Uh, and then the weight loss will usually continue thereafter for a pound or two a week. And let's just get a final view of things. And then we're finished. Again, thanks for all the questions that came in. Uh, I have a question over the series of the 100 plus that you've done, which has been your biggest loser, just out of curiosity? Question of, of our patients to date, what's the most weight loss we've seen? Uh, I think we're at a 130, 140 pounds uh, for our, our biggest loser. Does that sound about right, Tisha? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we've seen, we can see substantial weight loss with this. We've seen people lose uh, 30, 40% of their total body weight. Um, so we definitely can see that. It takes work though, you know, this is a tool, but it's, it, it, it can be done. All right, so we are finished. And again, you can just see how tight this is at the conclusion of the procedure. And we're gonna come out and we are done. If there are any other questions? Otherwise, we will probably say goodbye, and, but thanks to everyone for joining us. We really appreciate it. Hopefully this was useful in understanding the technique and how this is performed. Hopefully we've answered your questions. So we'll turn around. But otherwise, if there's nothing else, I think we'll say goodbye. So um, definitely any additional comments, you can post them to the video. We will have this up online uh, to be watched in the future. And uh, I think that concludes it. So again, thanks so much for joining us today.